Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third day of the RIC, the last day. This is the, yesterday was the penultimate, I guess this is the ultimate day of the RIC. And the, the panel that we've got here this morning is no need to reinvent the wheel, how countries are considering leveraging international regulatory experience in their licensing reviews. Uh, I'm actually, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be moderating this panel uh, this morning and pleased to be joined uh, by so many not only esteemed colleagues but also good friends uh, in, uh, in all of our travels and work together uh, around the world. So as you've heard throughout the conference, advanced reactor licensing and deployment is at the forefront of NRC's activities. However, we're not alone in tackling this challenge. Our counterparts around the globe are asking the same questions that we are as they navigate the best way to approach these complex and multifaceted projects. And we're talking. Whether it's through multilateral forums or bilateral relationships, regulators recognize their experience as being integral to licensing new reactor technologies. Together, we can all improve efficiencies in our respective licensing activities. And Illustrative example of the NRC's work in this area is our collaboration with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission on licensing small modular reactors. I should note that just on Monday, we added the United Kingdom to that arrangement as well. Under our memorandum of cooperation now, uh, so far, the NRC and CNSC have successfully collaborated on advanced reactor topics and have issued unified positions through, a first, of a, through first of a kind joint reports. Both regulators see an opportunity to further this collaboration effort by jointly addressing tangible regulatory issues in licensing reviews. We found this interaction invaluable, and I'm pleased to note that just yesterday, Ramsey Jamal of the CNSC and I assigned, well, I just already said that, uh, that, that uh, we added Mark Foy to this uh, on Monday, or on Tuesday, excuse me, and uh, bring them into the fold as we add more uh, technical topics for joint reviews I think is going to be absolutely um, uh, critical and I expect uh, this to be incredibly positive as we move forward. Uh, based on the NRC's experience, I firmly support close collaboration with our international counterparts and we've gathered an esteemed group, as I said, of colleagues and friends here to share their perspectives. First, I'm joined by Mr. Andrzej Glavatsky. Since March of 2023, Mr. Glavatsky has served as the president of Poland's National Atomic Energy Agency, or PAA. He has worked for the PAA for more than 16 years, holding such positions as vice president of PAA and director of Nuclear Safety and Security Department. He has extensive international experience representing Poland at both the NEA and the IAEA. Next, in a last minute addition, I am so pleased that Mr. Leslie Enos has been able to uh, in, uh, join us from the Ghana Nuclear Regulatory Authority. Um, he is a stress analyst at his organization. Mr. Enos is graciously stepping in uh, today uh, to share his agency's perspectives, and I look forward to hearing more about Ghana's plans for nuclear energy. Next, Dr. Carlo Asia joins us from the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute, where he has served as director from tw uh, since 2017. In his capacity as the PNRI NRI director, he's dedicated to promoting the peaceful applications of atomic energy and su supervising the safe and responsible use of nuclear science and technology in the Philippines. Prior to his appointment, he served as the director of the Philippine National Institute of Geological Sciences. Next. I'm joined by my good friend, Mr. Christopher Victorson, Director General of the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation. Director General Victorson has served as the head of FANR since 2015, and I'm pleased to have served as a co-chair with him last year uh, at the very successful International Conference on Effective Nuclear and Radiation Regulatory Systems in Abu Dhabi. Director General Victorson is a nuclear physicist with more than 35 years of national and international nuclear safety experience, including working at the NEA, the IAEA, and serving as Deputy Director General at the Swedish Nuclear Safety Authority. Last, certainly not least, we'll hear from Ms. Liddy Everard, Deputy Director General of the IAEA and the head of the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security. 
DDG Everard started her career at the French Ministry of Energy and has worked extensively in the regulatory field over the last 25 years, including positions at the Industry, Research and Environment Direction, of, uh, uh, Directorate of France's Ministry of the Environment, and France's Nuclear Safety Authority, where she most recently served as a commissioner. With such a strong panel day, I'm certain we'll have an exciting dialogue on the role that sharing international regulatory experience for licensing advanced reactors will play as we, de as we continue to see more advanced reactor designs develop. So without further delay, I'll turn to our first panelist, President Klavatsky. All right, thank you, Chair, for your kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now like a little bit like a movie star in this shiny, bright light. I'm gonna walk you through the uh, our PE approach to preparation for the licensing of uh, nuclear power plants. But also I'm gonna talk about how to increase regulatory effectiveness by using other uh, regulators' experience. So let's start. My presentation is divided into three parts. I'm going to give you some overview of the current status of the deployment of nuclear energy in Poland. Then I will uh, give you some example how to leverage cooperation with the foreign partners and what uh, more can be done. Well, on this slide, uh, you get some information on uh, the uh, major projects of the new builds in Poland. Uh, there is a government Polish nuclear power program which envisage uh, two nuclear power plants with the large, large light water reactors. Uh, the technology for this one has been already selected in November 2022. Uh, that's going to be Westinghouse design AP1000. There is uh, envisage to build a second nuclear power plant under this program, but the technology has not been selected yet. Another large program is the, uh, based on the APR 1400 Korean uh, design, but there is also a big, a great interest in SMRs in Poland, uh, and actually there are at least two main SMRs initiatives led by the Polish business, and they are based on the BWRX 300 and the new scale designs. Well, as of today, Poland uh, has zero nuclear capacity. Our main nuclear facilities is Research Reactor Maria with a thermal power of 30 megawatts, uh, focusing on the production of radioisotopes distributed to a large number of countries in the world. The second research reactor, EVA, is under the commissioning. Uh, on the material side uh, of house, we regulate over 8,000 activities involving use of ionizing radiation in medicine, industry, and science. But, as you can see, uh, there is a, a quite big interest in introducing nuclear power in Poland. Uh, on the map, you can see uh, potential sites for the new builds. And the one uh, which is at the very top of the map, uh, close to our sea, uh, which is called Lubiatovo Kopalina. This site has been selected for the first NPP AP1000 design. Also, uh, uh, in this uh, gray color, in the center of Poland, you will see the potential site for the Korean technology, and the, the yellow uh, orange uh, color is, is the potential, are the potential sites for the SMRs reactors. Now it's a, I'm going to give you a very quick overview and update of the recent developments of the government Polish nuclear power program. In the last year, there has been uh, several, several decisions made uh, by the regulator and the government, but also by the business uh, or the company which is uh, going to build the NPP. In last June, I've issued the general opinion for the AP1000 design, which is the pre-licensing mechanism in Poland uh, to inform prospective utility on regulatory expectations and explanations of the safety requirements based on the questions that they uh, may ask 
or they may, might be asked by the utility. There were also some several decisions issued by other state authorities. Ministry of Climate and Environment issued a decision in principle for the first NPP that gives green light for the investment in terms of political support based on national energy and national security decision. And finally, uh, the local governor of Pomorsky region issued location decision for the first NPP that is an administrative prerequisite for any activities on the site. On the business side, uh, Polish utility PJ, Polish nuclear power plant company, they signed contract with the Westinghouse and Bechtel on engineering services. So you can see that it is rather ambitious program in Poland, uh, also for PEA to be ready for this important task, uh, which is the licensing of the first nuclear power plant. We did a lot, uh, but we will continue, and we continue to, to do this uh, in terms of our capacity building. We maintain and develop cooperation with a large number of regulators around the globe, and in particular, taking into account reactor technologies selected for the first uh, investment in Poland. Uh, we focus on extending our cooperation with the three main partners, US NRC, uh, Canadian CNSC, and Korean S NSSC, well, together with the Kins. Our cooperation is based on a few proven capacity building, me building mechanism. It's an on the job training, which are the assignment of the PA safety specialist and nuclear inspector to the foreign regulators. That technical workshops focus on exchanging regulatory experience. Like just this year, this February, we hosted NRC staff and their contractors to work with us for a couple of weeks to prepare documents which will be used in the licensing process. There is a tailored cooperation on safety assessment. I would like to mention here a successful two years project with the US NRC under the umbrella of uh, IAEA to simulate licensing process and safety review of construction application that was recognized by the IRS mission as a good practice. Well, I consider the on-the-job on the training program as a huge support uh, in PEA's capacity building effort. We launched this program in 2015 with the help of several foreign regulators gathered in regulatory cooperation forum that is an active under the IEEA. We have already accomplished over 40 OJTs in eight countries, many of them hosted by, by the USNRC uh, at the TTC in Chattanooga, but also as a site visit and technical visit to the Vogel 3 and 4 construction. We've also started implementing OJT focus on SMR licensing. Uh, the assignment of our people to foreign regulators gave, gave our staff a great opportunity to get hands-on experience uh, of regulatory work in the field of help them to prepare for performing their regulatory job when, um, when we will perform our, our later on reviews. Well, we've uh, joined two initiatives uh, recently. Uh, which also give us opportunity to uh, be familiarized with the technologies, but also, like I mentioned, our uh, believe, we believe that uh, the best thing what you can do preparing for the uh, application is to uh, get to have a hands-on experience, hands-on training, uh, to work with the documents. Where, uh, as a conclusion, uh, our main challenges that we are facing is to have a, a simultaneously license more than one application. That's a, a big challenge. Uh, our original assumption was to have the same technology uh, under the Polish nuclear power program, whereas right now we have like a more than four new builds projects that have been developed uh, in Poland. So we adjusted our approach and capacity building to be ready for whether it lies ahead. Well, international co cooperation, especially with the US NRC and CNSC, is a crucial in our efforts to achieve full regulatory readiness. We are working to obtain good knowledge of design technologies before applications are submitted. Secondly, we also review our regulatory framework, and uh, in this way, we are using IEA uh, safety guides and requirements to uh, develop, to, up to update our uh, current legislative uh, framework. What are the next steps? 
Well, uh, we will continue in intensifying current cooperation and leveraging the experience of other regulators like USNRC to use pre-licensing period as much as possible to prepare ourselves for incoming application. We need to remember that once the application comes, we will on the clock. We will be on the clock, but we can somehow extend time available by uh, making best use of time that we have in the pre-licensing phase. Uh, PE will continue joint verification with other regulators on the safety of selected technical solutions in framework of the pre-licensing or licensing. As a part of the process of strengthening regulatory readiness in some areas, we are also um, we are also starting to share our experience and knowledge with other regulators, including other embarking countries like members of the RCF. Well, finally, uh, I'm going to touch uh, the harmonization of the nuclear regulatory requirements. And as I've mentioned, our approach is that, well, while, while using the IEA safety standard, we think we are in a more harmonized way and uh, be, being uh, ready to also uh, make changes in the best uh, possible ways, best practice, and use best practices uh, which are in the in the world. Well, with that, I think um, I'm a little bit uh, over the time, uh, unfortunately, but uh, I want to emphasize that. Um, we are not alone in the process, and like uh, Chairman Hanson quoted, uh, the optimism is a force multiplier, and uh, we are very looking forward to further cooperate with, uh, uh, with the, all the regulators, and especially to get the best that we can take from your experience. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, President Glavatsky. I really uh, appreciate all of your remarks in, the, in that really um, fascinating overview of the activities that are going on in, in Poland. And next, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hand the mic over to our friend, Mr. Enos, from the Ghanaian uh, Nuclear Regulatory Authority. Um, and we look forward to your remarks. Good morning, Chairman Hansen, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen of the conference. Um, I would like to thank Chairman Hansen for giving me the opportunity to give, um, present Ghana's perspective on the subject at hand. I am here today to um, replace um, the Director of Nuclear Relations of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority of Ghana. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here today, so. Um, I'm hoping that I would uh, help provide our perspective in a very good way. So my name is Leslie Inos, and I am a stress analyst of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority of Ghana. And today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about some few things. I'm going to give a brief history of the Ghana Nuclear Regulatory Authority. Then I'm going to follow it up with a brief description of what we do and how we regulate um, nuclear installations and other radiological facilities. Then halfway around the line, I'm going to give um, a description of all the international corporations we have been engaging so far and some of the challenges that we have faced. So the, the nuclear program of Ghana was formed by the GNPPO. The GNPPO was formed by the government, which constituted several institutions, um, some from the um, various power plants companies, the Nuclear Power Institute, the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Authority. So at the end of the phase one program, uh, the GNPPO developed a a program comprehensive report. And this 
was the main document we served as a decision-making uh, document for the government in order to show their commitment in the nuclear power program. And based on this document, the, the President Honorable Akufuado, uh, in July of 2022, uh, made a public declaration of Ghana's intentions of adding nuclear power to our energy mix. Um, furthermore, the government also developed energy transition policy, which also details the country's transition to a net zero carbon em emission economy. The Nuclear Regulatory Authority was a very vital uh, institution which was formed in the year 2016, which um, was mandated by um, the legal framework of the Act, which um, gives us our mandate in order to regulate all nuclear facilities and radiological facilities. Okay. So the Nuclear Regulatory Authority um, is guided by the NRA Act 895, and it's the authority is supposed to serve as um, the competent authority for regulation of all nuclear and radiological matters. So um, this scopes uh, development of um, regulations and guide management of radioactive waste spent for all, um, resulting from civilian applications in Ghana and also liability for nuclear damage. So the NRA, this is a brief um, organogram of the NRA. The NRA has three main um, branches, which is the Radiological and Non-Analyzing Directorate, the Nuclear Installation Directorate, and the Finance and Administrative Directorate. So um, the, the authority has currently um, 88 um, staff, and the most of 50% of the staffs came from the Ghana Atomic Energy in the year 2060 when the NRA was formed. So um, like I said before, so what we do is basically the same as most regulatory bodies. We try to um, conduct inspections to verify compliance. We issue um, authorizations and, um, uh, and licensing. We conduct um, enforcement duties as well, regulatory research and uh, implementations of international obligations of Ghana in the nuclear field. Also, we maintain a national register for radioactive radiation sources and for persons authorized to carry out any activity or practices related to source of radiation. Um, we also try to create public awareness on nuclear and radiation matters. Nuclear safety community. Um, we follow the IEA's um, general safety requirements, part one, and this involves this mandates us that we should have international obligations and arrangements for international corporations and assistance, and also we should be able to share operating experiences and regulatory experiences among other member state countries. Thank you. Through um, the work of our senior management, we have been able to um, engage with other international partners and uh, been able to sign agreements with certain uh, member states. So Ghana is part of the FNRB and also, um, also is receiving help from the U.S. Department of Energy in the area of nuclear security and also signed an MOU with the um, European institutions such as the INSC and ENCO, and this, uh, we are, with these institutions, we are benefiting from trainings and tutoring programs. So um, also, we have an MOU with the Canadian Nuclear City Commission, which was signed in 2019 of September, and uh, with the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority, which was also signed in December 2021. Some more on the um, NRC support for our nuclear program. We are privileged to receive a lot of help from the US NRC, and these are just a few that I would like to mention. So um, 
I was part of the workshop on the overview of NUREC 0800 because we were trying to um, develop our standard review plan, and this was held in Accra between 14 to 16 December of the year 2022. And also, we were also given some RAMP computer course training in April 2023. And um, the NRA Inspector Qualification and Training Program review took place also in May 2021. And lastly, um, this safety evaluation reports that are available online is used as a reference also in order for us to help us develop ours as well. And more on the international support. Um, we are having some challenges so far, and just to mention a few, uh, we are having some challenges of um, staff, shortage of staff, and because it's a government organization, we need permission from the government to employ. So um, we are hoping that the government increases our staff in order to perform our duties. And also we try to ensure that there are no supporting overlaps in terms of um, um, international supports that are given to us. And also we ensure that support needed is well tailored and meets specific needs of our country's requirements. Conclude, to conclude my presentation, I would like to say that um, Ghana is seeking to ensure safe and secured and safeguard introduction of nuclear power, and there is ongoing support from different uh, experienced regulatory bodies, and um, we are also in particular in with partnership with the US NRC, and this has been very strategic, and we are hoping to looking forward to further um, help from the US and RC as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Enos. And we really appreciate your, uh, your filling in here, I think, with about uh, 15 minutes notice. So uh, really, uh, really, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, of adaptability there. And uh, uh, certainly one of the other things that I think is coming up in Ghana is a, uh, is a peer review mission uh, to kind of review preparatory activities to regulate nuclear energy, I think, coming up in 2025, and we look forward to continuing uh, uh, to support that. Um, with that, we'll, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Carlo Arcia. Thank you very much. First, uh, thank you, NRC, for inviting us here. So I'll, this is my presentation. Uh, we have a long history of nuclear. Uh, we had a trigger reactor since the late 50s, and uh, actually we repurposed that research reactor just recently and made the first subcritical reactor made from trigger fuel. And we were the first to build a nuclear plant in the Southeast Asian region at Westinghouse PWR but was never used. It was completed. The fuel was outside, but in 1986, two things happened. Chernobyl happened, and we had a leadership change, and that's it. It was confined to the, the bin, and there are three exact models of this operating. But why do we consider nuclear power now? We have very expensive electricity rates, the most expensive in, in Asia, or per capita. 50% of our uh, electricity comes from coal, which is 90% imported, and then 20% uh, from a depleting gas field in the South China Sea, which is a, a hotbed of uh, problems right now, and uh, which uh, provide backload for international rules. Here is our electricity mix. By the way, we are number two or number three in geothermal, so our renewables is actually not bad as compared to many other countries, but you can see the difficulty here, 70% of the base load is under threat. Why nuclear? Because the median Filipino family pays more than 10 to 15% of take-home pay. This is an oppressive uh, rate if you compare your electricity rates. And there was a survey done in 2019 that 79% of the population supports nuclear because of the high electricity costs. We were surprised by these results. The national position, uh, one of the IEA 19 milestones has been signed by our president, and the two presidents that we have want nuclear power. 
the current president in his first state of the nation said we need nuclear. So, and uh, as a result, there is uh, the Philippine Atomic Bill to create an independent regulatory authority. Uh, right now, we are the regulators. I am the head of the regulation, but we're also promotion. And uh, our problem with the research reactor is that we made a reactor and we have to license it. So a clear case of conflict of interest. So this is it, and then it will take uh, the, uh, the, the x-ray machines come from the F our, our, our FDA, and that will be put into a regulatory authority called the Phil Atom. We are following the IAA uh, infrastructure guidelines. We had had an inner mission, and we will request for another one this year. An integrated work plan was done, but was stopped by COVID. And we have an EPIO dividing the 19 milestones into six subcommittees. And these have been very active in the past two or three years. And in Congress, actually just this week, as we were here, our nuclear liability law passed the lower house and it's now in, uh, in the Senate. So we will have two bills, a safety law and a nuclear liability law that hopefully will be passed this year. Now, people ask me, can we safely host uh, nuclear power plants? Because these are earthquakes, uh, of course, small ones and included, many earthquakes. This is a volcanic eruption in Taal in, uh, two years ago. So we have many disasters in the Philippines. We have the most typhoons in the world, volcanoes, tsunami, earthquakes, floods, landslides, and... Uh... <laughs> anyway, so when people ask me about safety, my answer to that is, if nuclear is unsafe, why does America have nearly 100 nuclear plants supplying 20% of electricity and operating to close to 60 years? So we rely on the American experience, 80 years total. And we can learn many things from American nuclear. 60 years of safe and clean nuclear operations, privately owned. The nuclear plants in the Philippines will be privately owned. And uh, we can adopt safety and technical findings. Uh, I'm learning a lot from this conference and from productive private government initiatives, PPPs. So, and train future manpower. I owe my training to the US. I'm a Fulbright scholar. I did my master's and doctorate here. Thank you. And then, but I also tutored black and uh, Hispanic kids in Chicago. I'm proud of uh, those I tutored. They are now uh, uh, productive uh, uh, citizens. Here is uh, our president meeting with U.S. Nuclear Corporation, nuclear corporation uh, and then the, with the small modular or micro-modular plants. Our president is technical. I was impressed by his questioning. And then so, so the insight we gain from the experienced regulators, the separation of the promotional body, which has also happened in the U.S., we, that's really important. And uh, we adopt and establish regulations and standards for siting, licensing, Radiation protection standards, and we want to learn uh, more. And uh, on the job training, these are the strategies that we want training courses and workshops, technical assistances. And, oh, anyway, the challenges and considerations. One, when we created the, uh, the, the uh, there are pushbacks from interfering government regulations. Some government regula uh, regulators don't want to surrender their turf. And then there are also some, as I said, the oligarchs and the politicians. Though the, those are the real disasters, by the way. The rest you can live with, you know? <laughs> so challenges to regulatory independence, this perceived overlapping co regulatory coverages. For example, there was an attempt to int introduce commercial policy into safety law. And we were saying that you know, we had a, re a law review by the IEA, but some powerful politicians up to now are trying to insert this. And fortunately, uh, they will be defeated. Uh, the nuclear safety law was voted 200 versus seven. Okay, so. And how do you fund an independent regulatory body without yearly congressional budgetary approval? Because you can be held hostage by congressmen who want the nuclear plant approved in their, uh, in their jurisdiction. So. And we have to integrate into nuclear law the updated conventions in nuclear. I'm very proud to say that uh, the CSC, uh, Convention for Supplementary Compensation, is well integrated into our nuclear liability law, which is being discussed and will be passed this year. Then how do you select the regulators? That's why I was very curious how the regulators are selected. Technical versus legal background. 
In our law, it says there that the regulators have to have technical background. No lawyers. I mean, you can have a law degree if you have a scientific <laughs> background. <laughs> anyway, uh, I have a lot of lawyer jokes I can tell you in the in break. Later on. So future prospects are this. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Asiya. Uh, we do have both technical people and lawyers in the NRC. Uh, we benefit from both. Um, I personally hardly ever travel without a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> so please, let me hand over the microphone now to uh, my good friend, Christopher Victorson. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. And um, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to addressing this uh, particular Rick Oop. with this, I think these are uh, Liddy's, Liddy's slides. But it's all right. We're gonna, we're gonna, go we're gonna for, switch to we're gonna slides. Go yeah. Yeah. Uh, addressing the, the changing uh, landscapes in the world. Uh, so I have chosen to title uh, my presentation to Tanner, which is the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation in the UAE, which is the Nuclear Regulatory Authority. And as um, my friend from Philippines mentioned, we were created in 2009. Uh, and we do have a, or live in a very changing landscape. So let me uh, quickly um, take you through some of the historical points that we have uh, faced and the successes that we have made. Um, if you could take the next slide, please. Yeah, the, a, uh, yes, he's coming. So um, this is a, a picture uh, with the four uh, nuclear power plants that now are in, in operation. Uh, so the first one uh, went into operation in commercial operation in 21, the second one in 22, the third one in 23, and the fourth one we gave the operating license in November last year, and they are now uh, in the startup phase, went critical, and in a few, few weeks I believe they will connect to the grid, and then the commercial operation later this, this year. Um, so this has this site, it was a beach, a beautiful beach, when I went there the first time in 2009, and now it's completely different. A small city uh, with a lot of infrastructure uh, that is needed for a nuclear power plant. So it's a, it's a major project. Um, and the interesting thing is that FANR and ENEC, which is the Emirate Nuclear Energy Corporation, uh, that is the developer, um, and it's an Abu Dhabi government entity. We are a federal entity. There is a difference between the two. Um, so we were established at the same time. In 2009, we were sitting in the same building. Only a small wall was separated me and uh, Mohammed Hamadi, who is the CEO of ENEC. So this was, the, I, I think, the start of the creation of a good safety culture. Because we had the same goal. We said, let's establish this, uh, this um, power program uh, as, a, uh, as a model for the world, using the, the milestone approach of the IEA. So it was uh, sort of built during the same time as the milestone approach was created. Um, so we had this, we worked on the same timeline, um, both of us. So we knew when ENEC needed a certain regulation, because there were no regulation in place. We had to start from scratch uh, with the regulation. Anyway, um, it's a long story, and there is many interesting topics to be covered. But the first license application we got in December 2010. So between 
2009 and December 2010, we, work, we worked on a sort of pre-licensing concept. We knew which reactor would be chosen because the, the reactor was chosen, the contract was signed already in December 2009. Uh, and today we have the full infrastructure with all covering all the 19 elements of the IEA milestone document. Next slide, please. So this is FANR, uh, in some, some uh, numbers that shows what, where we are today. We are uh, 255 staff. Uh, we have the responsibility, not only Baraka, we, have, we are regulating all the medical and industrial use of radiation. We have security aspects, of course, and safeguards. So all these uh, nuclear aspects we are in charge of. We started to be a completely foreign expert-driven organization. Today we are an Emirati-led uh, organization, uh, and the number of Emiratis are tw uh, 74, um, and two of them are here with me. Um, so this is the two you see in the in, in this the same box that says 74. They are with me. So Rashid, he is not dressed in in white uh, kandura today, uh, and Mira. Um, who normally is in black abaya uh, in, in when they work. So they are with me and they have been with us about 10 years. And they, have today, they are today two of the many influencers, I would say, in FANR, um, impacting the organization. Uh, Mira is an inspector, has been um, a resident inspector in Baraka. Uh, and Fanner, um, uh, Rashid is the manager of international cooperation. So I'm very proud of you. So we have had very successful emiratization program. So I'm um, very confident that uh, the, the nationals in the UAE will shoulder the, the responsibility for safety, security and safeguards in an excellent way. We have a lot of females, we have 44% of females, it, and this has come naturally, because in the UAE, the majority of the STEM students are females. So it, it's, it has been a natural uh, evolution. Um, we have a, a very young population. We are, 60% uh, are below uh, 35. The, the use is, is defined as between uh, 18 and, 20, and, and 35. Uh, we have many leader, leadership positions, 80% are, that's why I said uh, uh, Emirati-led organization. Next slide, please. So we, we, knew, we do have now all the um, reactors in operation. So it's, uh, we, we have switched from licensing into, cons um, into operational oversight. And then, of course, as you all re realize, Safety culture is an important aspect of, um, of, of the operation. So I have, uh, we have been active in, in, in internationally. Uh, you heard yesterday uh, in one of the sessions about the NEA Working Group on Leadership and Safety Culture. We have been there. Um, we have created an internal safety culture working group. Um, we had an uh, IEA mission in, in September to teach us about how to do a self-assessment of the internal safety culture, uh, which we will do uh, next year probably. And um, I announced in November last year that 2024 will be a year of safety culture at FANR, uh, which will influence our own uh, program and our own inspectors, particularly focus on, on the inspectors. The resident inspectors have, do have an important influence on the safety culture of the operator in particular. Next slide, please. I will be quick. So we will also uh, focus our oversight activities on safety culture, not only, of course, but we will include an element of safety culture in most of the inspections that we are doing. Next one, please. So uh, 
Another change is the COP28. So on the 2nd of December uh, last year in Dubai, uh, 22 heads of states came physically to Dubai to sign the tripling uh, declaration of nuclear energy by 2050 in the, in the perspective of the climate change. Uh, on this opportunity, we also um, had a workshop with the IEA, uh, with WMO, and with um, presence of EDF on, on, um, on the resilience of nuclear power plants um, for challenges caused by, by climate change. So we have officially launched and working now on a transformational project, which we call Integrated Operational Nuclear Safety. I can talk more about it later. Um, next slide, please. We had a, another important event that I would like to point to, namely the regulatory conference. And the regulatory conference agreed on four themes, uh, and, and these themes are not only for FANER, it's for all regulators. So I, uh, we worked together with, with NRC chairman, Chris, to, to make sure that we have a follow-up and make sure that um, regulators really commit and take actions in, in these four areas. And we are certainly doing, doing it in, inside FANER. Um, next one, please. Um, so, based on this COP28 uh, signal, we realized that more nuclear will come. Uh, we don't know, no decision has been made in the UAE, but we, ex we expect, and as we have heard during this conference, we need to be ready as regulators. So we have created a task force, we, we call it FANER Growth, to study the consequences of, of additional big reactors and SMRs. And this is just some information about the... And the last slide is next one. Um, talking about the, the changing regulatory landscape. So many of us have, men, uh, or my colleagues have mentioned this uh, leveraging the resources. And we certainly did that uh, when, we, um, when we started licensing of, of Baraka. These are Korean APR 1400 reactors. Uh, they, there was a reference plant in Korea built and operated, licensed, the reactor was licensed by NRC before, System 80 plus of so combustion engineering, it was licensed by KINS. So we said in FANER, why should we redo everything? There is no reason. We trust what, what uh, NRC did and we trust what KINS did. Of course, we, had, we reviewed exactly what they did. So we, this allowed us to focus on specific UAE um, factors, like, at, like the weather, environment, uh, etc., and on the organizational setup, on, on the topics that we were, we were responsible ourselves. Um, so also, a second message is that there is a big contrast, be contrast between uh, being a regulator with operational oversight and licensing. This is, uh, you have, in operational oversight, you need to be ready. You have to have the, op the, the full oversight uh, or full uh, uh, infrastructure in place, and you need to be ready to act 24 7. And we have experienced that at FANER. Many weekends we have worked, uh, and this, this, this is a must. And we are adhering to the um, recommendations from the REG conference. And we make sure that we have the highest standard for safety security um, of, of, and safeguards under this tripling. And this needs some additional also international cooperation. So um, I would really urge the international regulatory community to work together in order to challenge or to face all the challenges of the tripling initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General Victorson, for your presentation. And um, I, w I would note that there are even, I think, some really leading edge uh, things going on in the UAE with regard to regulation. For instance, your 
dedicated cybersecurity incident response center, and I, I believe there's a, a director for innovation in your organization now that even as you're building this capability, you're also leaning forward and, and looking at changes as well. So thank you very much. And next I'd like to hand over the, the microphone to uh, director, uh, Deputy Director General Lydia Everard. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to uh, address you today at the RIC, uh, and I will give you an overview of the IA activities to support regulatory infrastructure and uh, SMR uh, safety. First, the IAEA, uh, established in 1957, has uh, 178 member states and works under the motto Atoms for Peace and Development. The mission of the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security is to provide a strong and sustainable global nuclear safety and security frameworks with the development of safety standards, the provision of uh, peer reviews for their application, and the implementation of uh, legal instruments uh, such as the Convention on Nuclear Safety. The agency is highly committed to building national capabilities in nuclear safety, especially for embarking countries. The IA develops a series of uh, safety standards that serve as a global reference for member states for protecting people and the environment, and they contribute to a harmonized high level of safety worldwide. To date, 134 safety standards have been published and, 100 and, and, sorry, and 36 are under development. There are three levels of safety standards, safety uh, fundamentals, with uh, one safety objective, which is on the slide, uh, and uh, that states that uh, the, this fundamental uh, safety objective is to protect people and the environment from harmful effects of uh, ionizing uh, radiation. And then there are other levels, so safety requirements and safety guides. The IA uh, supports uh, its member states via safety review services in which member states' practices are compared with these uh, international safety standards. In 2023, the agency conducted over 60 safety-related peer reviews um, uh, and advisory missions, and as you can see, there are many different reviews, uh, for instance, on regulatory uh, infrastructure, such as uh, RS missions, on operational safety, other missions on long-term operation uh, safety, so SALTO, but uh, also on uh, topical you know, uh, matters such as uh, safety of uh, research reactor or safety of uh, fuel, fa um, fuel cycle facilities. The Global Nuclear Safety and Security Network, so the GNSSN, is a web platform whose missions uh, comprise three elements. First, sharing knowledge, experience, and lessons learned, supporting interactions and collaboration amongst member states, and uh, supporting capacity building. The GNSSN includes 20 networks in total that include regional and topical networks. The Regulatory Cooperation Forum, so RCF, facilitates collaboration between member states uh, with established nuclear power, power programs and member states uh, embarking or expanding uh, on such, uh, on such uh, programs. The RCF has uh, contributed to multiple uh, instances of bilateral assistance, including engagement uh, between the US and Poland and activities uh, of uh, the European Commission in Africa. So this slide is, you know, a, directly linked to the topic of uh, the RIC, so that's interesting to have this kind of connection. That means that it's really, you know, uh, a major topic for all of us. So how uh, are we preparing for the future? In uh, 2023, uh, we uh, uh, held this uh, regulatory conference, uh, which is on the slide. And as you already mentioned, so the environment uh, we are working in is uh, always evolving, which impacts the role of reg regulators. The past few, year, few years have uh, brought uh, several examples, uh, the global pandemic, of course, uh, emerging new technologies, or ensuring nuclear safety and, uh, and security uh, in, uh, during armed conflicts. So this is a few examples that uh, illustrate uh, what we need to address, and uh, usually in a kind of uh, unpredict yes, un unpredictable uh, conditions. 
in 2023, with this uh, international conference uh, in Abu Dhabi, regulators shared uh, their experience, particularly with regard to building resilience and agility to respond to new challenges. Thank you very much again to you, uh, Chair Hansen, and to uh, Kister uh, Victorson for, for serving as President and Vice President. Thank you to the United Arab Emirates for hosting this conference, which was a very successful conference with more than 600 participants, and this very clear call for actions. This is the next step. I think a conference is an important step, but the follow-up actions are equally you know, important. Now, Moving on to uh, the agency activities and SMRs. In 2022, the agency completed an extensive uh, review of uh, the applicability of uh, the safety standards to SMRs. And this uh, review of applicability uh, is guiding us uh, for preparing our plan for the future and how to address uh, safety-related matters for SMRs. In uh, 2022, the Director General of the IAEA launched a new initiative called uh, NESI, for, uh, that uh, stands for Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, with the objective to achieve progress towards uh, harmonization of uh, regulatory approaches and standardization of designs, and thereby facilitating the safe and secure deployment of SMRs. NESI has two tracks, one on uh, industrial matters and another one on regulatory matters. Regarding uh, the regulatory track, um, there are three uh, working groups uh, dealing with how to share information. Uh, second, how to uh, develop a multinational pre-licensing joint review process. And third, uh, how to develop uh, best practices for regulators to work together on ongoing reg uh, regulatory reviews. As you can see uh, from the map, uh, uh, there is a broad participation from uh, several uh, member states uh, throughout uh, the world. Regarding NESI uh, timeline, we are currently finalizing the first phase of uh, NESI, and we are preparing for the next steps uh, to be discussed uh, at the plenary meeting of NESI to be held uh, in October this year in, uh, in Vienna. Our long-term aspiration is to develop a common review framework, and this is really our uh, main objective. We plan to continue to enhance uh, processes for regulators to leverage and learn uh, from past uh, reviews, thereby saving resources, while still maintaining a high level of safety and allowing regulators uh, to maintain their sovereignty in decision making. International cooperation uh, also provides a foundation for addressing global challenges, including in uh, unprecedented uh, conditions. I would like to give two examples. First, on uh, the assistance to Ukraine. Since uh, February 2022, the agency has been provided support to Ukraine with regard to uh, the safety and security of its facilities. And uh, with the main objective uh, of uh, preventing a nuclear accident in Ukraine. In particular, we have deployed a continuous uh, presence of the agency uh, in Ukraine. We have delivered uh, equipment, uh, safety and security related equipment to Ukraine. Thanks to a strong support uh, from member states, and I would like to uh, thank uh, very much the US, uh, who is one of the major uh, supporters uh, for this uh, comprehensive program of assistance to Ukraine. We also develop, and this is the second uh, completely different, of course, examples. We develop some uh, support and assistance, uh, ad hoc uh, support to member states with a first of a kind of facilities. For instance, uh, with fin we are working with Finland uh, for the deep uh, geological um, repository, and uh, we were, are working on a peer review uh, to address operational safety of such a facility. So in conclusion, uh, the agency will continue to support member states for knowledge and experience sharing to build um, on uh, the existing wealth of knowledge uh, to remain proactive and flexible in responding to the diversity of uh, member states' needs um, and to contribute to strengthening safety and security worldwide in this uh, rapidly changing environment. I agree that there is no need to reinvent uh, the wheel. This is a topic of uh, this uh, session, but there is a clear need to think outside the box, to find innovative ways of us performing our mission in order to be more effective and more efficient in addressing new challenges. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Liddy, for that, and particularly that that last uh, bullet in the in the closing sentiment. I uh, couldn't agree more. Obviously, well, let's uh, let's get into some questions here, um, and uh, and 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 have a bit of a dialogue. I'd like to start off with. Um, I think this is a question for Poland and and our friends from Ghana and the and the Philippines, really, about how is your country planning to leverage licensing reviews and data from vendor countries in your review process? And I think this could be a question as, as well for, um, for Fanner in order to talk about you know, pre-existing reviews on the APR 1400 and other how, thinking about how if new technologies are going to be deployed in the UAE as well. And what do you think are the greatest challenges to accepting information from another country in your national review process? You can go first. Thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for this question. Actually, we are currently working on this uh, since the AP1000 was the first uh, NPP which is going to build in Poland. And it all already has been licensed uh, in US. It has already uh, been built, constructed, and is in the operation. So, our approach is that we don't want to, like, uh, also like Fanner, uh, don't want to review all the technical information from the beginning. We wanted to take the, the benefit of the, of the work and the assessment which has been done in the U.S. Uh, and um, to take some of those to our review. There are some legal challenges, of course, to, to um, on to what extent we can we can use this kind of uh, information, but uh, for sure uh, the aspects which are quite general, we're gonna uh, take them into the our review and our assessment. We're gonna focus on the site specifics. We're gonna focus on the uh, our environmental specific uh, issues. There are some differences in requirements. And this is what I wanted to emphasize. So the biggest challenge is make sure that you understand what was the, the design basis, what was the legal basis in the country of origin versus what is in your country, against what kind of requirements the design was verified uh, in the country of origin. Because if the, the requirements, well, if they match, and you verify, you understand that they are matching, you are on the safe side. But if, if and you do not understand, and you will take uh, the review um, as it is, not understanding what were the requirements in the country of origin, you may have some troubles. So we are currently doing this. So we are verifying and uh, using the time with what we have, which we have right now to compare also the requirements in US and in Poland to be uh, knowledgeable enough uh, that we can assure then when we will get the application, we will be knowing which kind of documents, reviews we are able to accept. So I'm gonna uh, live with that and I give the floor to the next speaker. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> regarding the question, the, in our current law that will be approved soon, there's a provision that uh, if a technology has been licensed uh, in another country uh, with a credible uh, uh, background that we can consider that, uh, so to shorten the, uh, the licensing. Uh, and I think this is especially important uh, for SMRs. The Philippines is interested in SMRs because we have 7,000 islands. And the most expensive power are those not connected to the grid. And so, but the problem with the SMRs is that there are 100 designs. They're mostly PowerPoints. We need power plants. <laughs> so, so you, we, we need that something is operating because it's the only way that you can check. Yeah. A anybody can sell anything. You know, so there's no first of a kind. I mean, you guys won't buy a first of a kind car. 
what more for a nuclear power plant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please. Yes, a few comments from, from, from Fanner. So first on the new technology. Um, yes, we have to prepare to be ready to, to review a new technology, whether it's a light water reactor or a, a small modular reactor or other types of, of new technology. Uh, and on the question of there, there are 80 or 90 different designs, that's true. But you can also, if you work with the industry, you can, um, you can screen all these designs. I mean, we have done it, and we are down to five or six, of in, uh, which could be of interest. Uh, and I think that is one aspect. And then we studied those, uh, and studied the country of origin, who are the, 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 the sort of vendors of these types of reactors, and make sure that we understand their regulatory system. On the acceptability of the country of origin reviews, it's, it's an important topic to, to, to discuss and reflect on, and we are trying to, to work in, the N, NC, in, in this uh, initiative that was mentioned from the IEA, uh, Nuclear Safety and Harmonization, Nuclear Harmonization and, and Standardization Initiative. In working group three, uh, there is a particular effort to, to, to document how, how, uh, and um, yes, how you can accept this type of reviews by other regulators. First of all, you need to understand their safety philosophy. You need to understand their regulatory uh, system, and you need to understand the operating experience. Uh, I think the reference plant concept is a very, very important concept to keep in mind if you want to be. Uh, effective and efficient, and use that. Um, and then, but there will al always be differences between the reference plant and the plant that you will get, because of local conditions, you have to adapt. We have many, many such differences. So we asked from the, from ENEC, from the applicant, to develop what we call a departure report, which is a gap analysis between or the different the differences between the Shin Korea plant in Korea and the Baraka design. Mm -hmm. uh, there were um, differences in cooling systems because of the temperature, environmental conditions. There were differences in, in the frequency of the electricity. We have different national systems. And all these th things need to be very clear. So those are the focus of the regulatory uh, attention. So once you understand this, I think it's, uh, it's easier to, to accept. We had also second D from Kins sitting in our office for, for, for many years to help us to understand the, re the Korean regulatory system. Mm -hmm. We will follow the same methodology for any new nuclear power program, whether it's SMRs or light water reactors of, of a big size. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to j jump in, uh, Mr. Enos? Okay, so um, I would just like to say that in perspective of uh, Ghana, we, right from the beginning of developing regulations and guides, we are encouraged to um, not do anything in isolation. We try to look at perspectives from other countries and what their um, requirements are like. So everything is, everything is developed with um, information from other countries. We take all those things into consideration. And um, all our regulations and documents are being reviewed um, through um, other organizations, international organizations, which where they try to um, incorporate uh, new technologies. And we try to consider um, the new technologies which are coming up in our regulations as well. And uh, last, lastly, we some challenges that we are facing is uh, basically inexperience, but um, we have a very strong uh, human, uh, human uh, competency development plan, which is currently ongoing, and uh, most of our staff are, have received um, 
from level one to level four of this training and uh, more support from other international organizations is being provided to us in order to make us uh, prepared for our review and assessment process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Director General Everard, I wanted to ask a kind of follow-up question. Um, uh, uh, Director General Victorson raised uh, Nessie and Working Group 3, and as we were having this conversation, I was curious about how uh, the particular instances of frameworks uh, and countries adopting uh, other reviews is kind of being generalized and elevated um, uh, at that higher level, and certainly uh, Director General Victorson kind of touched on that, but I wondered if you'd like to expand on it a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, question. So NESI, it's a new approach uh, for the agency and I think for uh, many member states because uh, we are considering different approaches at uh, national level or at regional level because there are some uh, initiatives at uh, so the US, Canada, uh, in uh, Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So we uh, observe that uh, there are uh, already some ongoing work how to uh, learn from other uh, experiences and how to leverage, uh, you know, uh, this uh, lessons learned for the benefit of uh, a greater um, efficiency, of course, but in addition to avoid uh, duplication, because we can observe that uh, there are similarities, of course, in uh, the, uh, throughout these uh, different initiatives, and we uh, may have some benefit from uh, capitalizing uh, this uh, new uh, this experience uh, experience in on new um, designs. So this is really uh, the concept of NESI. Uh, after two years now, we have uh, learned a lot, including regarding the definition of the objective. And really, uh, now I think it's uh, clearer that the objective is to facilitate the safe and secure, secure deployment of SMRs. So it's not only how to deploy SMRs, but how to make it uh, as safe and secure as possible. And there is a wealth of knowledge throughout the world, and NSE is really aimed at uh, capitalizing, you know, this uh, great experience, and then putting this experience at uh, the level of uh, the, at the global level, so that many member states can benefit from this experience, even if member states' needs are very different. We have uh, uh, countries with uh, very developed nuclear programs, but we have member states. Uh, that would like to use uh, SMRs for domestic needs, and they are, sta uh, sta yes, they are starting from scratch. So we are trying to um, have this international co co cooperation as a uh, first uh, multiplier, as we mentioned on uh, Tuesday, and this is really, you know, this objective. Thank you. I've got a number of questions from the audience, so I'm going to start to, to go to those. And the first one that I have here is for Director General Victorson. And, you know, I think there's a question here that I think was drilling into maybe some of the lessons that you've learned as standing up an entire uh, regulatory body while, um, uh, you know, while safely licensing and overseeing the construction and so forth. and and. Particularly, are there lessons that maybe haven't gotten as much attention, but that you thought were really um, uh, contributed to your uh, um, uh, success? Yes, certainly there are. Um, we were in a particular situation. Uh, as we have heard uh, from this panel, my colleagues in the panel, there are um, already programs uh, or regulators uh, existing. In the UAE, we didn't have anything of that. So this is a, a difference. So we, we started really from scratch. So the approach was recruit experienced foreigners to establish the regulator. Uh, but this was not fast enough. We couldn't do it fast enough to, to cover the capacity and capabilities. So we contracted technical support organizations, um, two US-based and one European-based, and divided the PSAR, the application uh, chapters, um, and distributed to them. And we 
uh, our expats um, that we hired, they led, they were project managers, and they led the TSOs and made sure that, um, that we got the results that we needed according to our, um, our own regulations. So we needed to provide hundreds of, of detailed instructions to the TSOs. So it was a significant work to do in order to lead them. And, and the, the people we recruited, they were knowledgeable to make the decisions. So we made our own decisions. We were a small organization, but we relied on external organizations. We used a lot of IEA support. Um, I should mention that the first in-ear mission we had in 2011, where they checked that we have programs ongoing to cover all the infrastructure elements. So we, we needed security, we needed off-site emergency, we needed safeguards, mm -hmm. and many other organizations are involved in this. Security organizations, customs for export-import control, et cetera, et cetera, environment, et cetera. Um, so, and then the first IRS in 2012, um, quite early stage, uh, but this was in relation to our issuance of the construction license. We issued the first construction license in July 2012. It was a little bit delayed because of the Fukushima accident. So we had to factor in. So we, we sort of stopped and paused and joined NSREG approach in Europe um, and, and made sure we understood how they did this in, in, in the European countries. And we used the same methodology, identify the cliff edge effects and in, in various types. And then we were done by that uh, by July 2012. And then we could issue the construction license for Unit 1. We have also another concept which I didn't mention before, something called International Advisory Board. So the government of Abu Dhabi set up something called an International Advisory Board with high level um, experienced policymakers uh, and nuclear professionals from a number of countries. It was led by previous IEA Director General Hans Blix. Uh, there were representatives from France, from US, from Korea, from Japan, from all over the world with, with, with experience. And they, they were very challenging. Uh, they came twice a year, twice a year and ask a report, not only FANR, they ask ENEC, they ask Khalifa University on the, on the capacity building side, ask the other authorities to come and report what is the progress you have made, and, uh, and gave us advice. If you are interested to follow this work, they published very transparent reports on the internet. So you can, International Advisory Board of the UAE, you can find all, all their reports and it, it gives you the history of, of our development. This was a very useful concept, which gave us support. It gave the international community confidence that we were developing the program peacefully and in line with highest standards of, of safety, security, and safeguards. Thank you. Well, no, that's fascinating, and I think there are a number of good points. I'd like to pick up on just one, and I want to ask the, some of our other colleagues about the use of TSOs and how, uh, in in each of you know your unique contexts, how you're approaching the issue uh, uh, um, uh, of, of the use of, of a TSO and and kind of what the status of those agreements uh, are. Any, you can go first again. All right, thank you so much. Um, well, since uh, we don't have, uh, Poland don't have uh, an experience in uh, licensing nuclear power plant yet, then we did not create any uh, unified TSO for regulatory authority in Poland. We rather uh, wanted to use different uh, organizations, different institutions to, uh, on different disciplines that we will that they will help us uh, reviewing the documentation and uh, there is a, a mechanism in Poland uh, which uh, is called the authorization for the TSO uh, this is a kind of a mechanism to 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 pre, pre verify the uh, the institution the which 
uh, has to have enough competence, but also to avoid a conflict of interest. And this is a this is a mechanism we we use uh, up to now. Um, so we've, uh, as a as a regulatory authority, we've uh, kind of uh, selected the these topics which we will uh, ask for the technical uh, external support and the competences we do not, not be able to build uh, in-house. These are some siting site specifics. There are some uh, competences in the site examination, but also the review of uh, safety assessment, uh, safety analysis. The biggest challenge which I see, and we are working on that currently, is that uh, according to our Polish law, we got uh, 24 months uh, to review the documentation when the application will come. And you can imagine that uh, with this kind of system of technical support organizations, you have to, we have to go through the uh, public procurement process, which probably in some of the countries, at least in our country, it may take time. So we wanted to uh, kind of uh, also take this time before the application will come to prepare an agreement with those institutes, those institutions which are going to help us with the technical uh, analysis, being ready before the application will come. And the mechanism, we have some ideas which kind of mechanism we can use, but it's a, it's a like a big challenge and advice if, if you guys uh, trying to use this kind of system, uh, make sure that when, <laughs> when the application will come, you will have a direct path to the institute you choose uh, that they can help you. Thanks. Anyone else wanna, would anyone else like to, to, to tackle that? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one of the questions that I've got here on the iPad actually has to do with how are the countries in this group actually helping other countries? So for instance, you know, uh, our friends in Poland and Ghana and the Philippines, you all have taken significant steps to prepare to regulate uh, nuclear energy. How are your phones ringing from other countries who might be might be ready to learn uh, from where you are uh, on that on that journey? Yeah, please, Dr. Garcia. Yeah, uh, the Philippines is part of the ASEAN. ASEAN is the largest agglomeration of countries, about 600 million people with no nuclear power, and it's one of the richest too per capita. That includes Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines. And, and then uh, differing, uh, differing levels of economic development. But we have a group called ASEAN TOM, which is the Association of uh, Regulators, and we meet yearly. Mm -hmm. And believe me, in that meeting, there's an exchange, who's, who's going to be the first? And it looks like the Philippines is going to be the first. But I'll, I'll, I'll say this, one member, Singapore, for example, actually very interesting, Singapore has not ruled out nuclear power. But they said, that since we're so small, they cannot afford a nuclear accident. And so what they did is they put up a nuclear safety research institute inside the university, and its only job is to vet existing technologies. They say, we have to choose the safest, and they're willing to share, and they've shared, especially vendor uh, characteristics, and you know, a vendor, vendors are like, car salesmen, they promise you everything, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's good to, among countries, to see, you know, what, what are they offering you? And then, so for the realistic, and, and we will be doing that, uh, we are doing that now in the, in the ASEAN. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ines, are you, is the, is the, is the phone ringing in, in, in Ghana from, uh, from neighboring countries about your journey on, uh, to, to nuclear safety regulation? Yes, yes. So, um, in relation in relation to Ghana, um, we 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 have come quite a long way in the nuclear power program. Uh, we are currently in the phase two. Um, so, uh, we through the we are Ghana is one of the founding members for the um, forum for 
nuclear regulatory authorities in Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, the, there are two currently senior management uh, acquiring positions in that forum where they extend uh, uh, their expertise to other African countries like uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Morocco. So um, in this way, we're trying to leverage uh, the opportunities in order to also give other helping hands to other African countries. Yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So there is one topic that I think is very, very essential. That is the regulation. So you are immediately faced with what type of regulations, design, siting, etc. Mm -hmm. So our approach was to rely on IAEA safety requirements, uh, which are, I would characterize them as risk-informed, performance-based. Um, and of course you have to, so we, we adopted essentially them, not word by word. We changed some aspects that were needed to be changed uh, because of local conditions. It can uh, security guidance is one example, um, and also design. We are now refine, um, revising the design uh, regulations um, based on new uh, revision of IEA, but also because we might get new, um, new applications to site um, uh, power plants in the UAE. And we need to factor in uh, the climate change af aspect, because we need to re recognize that the uh, nuclear facility, it will stay there for uh, one century, uh, 100 years. And many things can happen around us because of the climate change, which we might need to s s uh, think about when we site a new, a new nuclear facility. So this is an important consideration that we will include now in the new revised regulations. Um, we have recently updated the regulations on, on leadership and management for safety um, and included, included requirements for the licensee um, to make sure that on their highest level they consider safety. Uh, we had recently an inspection in, in, uh, for NAWA, led by Mira, by the way, on, on the integrated management system of the operator, uh, including the safety culture, because IMS sets the basis for a good, safe, strong safety culture. Um, and uh, they looked at documents from the board. They interviewed the top management of the utility, the CEO, the CNO, etc., and uh, tried to see um, are there anything that uh, that uh, are um, uh, are against the, the 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 spirit of safety culture? Do they have a questioning attitude? Do they have employ employee concern programs, for example, in the utility? Uh, another topic is the peer review services. We have benefited a lot from IEA peer review services. We have done 12 or 13. I don't. Know, uh, almost all of them, and all are, 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 have, have given us very valuable advice. Um, so I'm grateful, thank you, for, for the IEA to, to keep this going. Um, we are a member of RCF, by the way, too, and we have a, a many requests to, to, uh, to meet with other um, embarking countries in order to learn from the experience of, of UAE and FANR, and we are willing to do that. One of the principles of the UAE government is transparency, so we are, we are willing to share. But we try to go through as much as possible through IEA, through the various documents and conferences, and share our, our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Glavatsky or Deputy Director General Everett, would you, would, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I wanted to emphasize this RCF uh, initiative, actually, which we are also a part of, and um, we ready to share our experience. Well, surprisingly, uh, there are some, I see some faces from the uh, European regulators who approach me uh, sometime, uh, because 
Well, it, we got some knowledge, some experience in preparing for the li licensing, the new reactors, especially SMRs, and, and uh, we are ready to, to share this kind of experience. One thing I wanted to also add is that uh, please uh, document the work, work that you have done uh, to share then the experience that you can gain. Yeah, just a few words uh, to uh, maybe uh, follow up on uh, what uh, just uh, was mentioned on the, the s services uh, provided by the agency. So the uh, range of uh, activities is very wide, but we are continuing, you know, uh, expanding the possibilities with uh, uh, ad hoc uh, services, and uh, we will uh, continue like this so that uh, we remain very proactive, flexible, and. Uh, in order to meet uh, member states' uh, new uh, expectations and need, and uh, of course uh, with this objective of uh, maintaining a very high level of uh, safety and security worldwide through this experience sharing and how to facilitate the support we can provide to uh, each member states considering their specific expectations and needs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have just about come to the end of our time together. As I said in my speech on Tuesday, I think there's too much work around the world for all of us to accomplish and tackle alone, particularly as regulatory bodies. And it's a, a great pleasure for me to have uh, close friends and collaborators like those on this stage. So please join me in giving them a round of applause and thanks for their participation. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Now, if this wasn't enough, uh, light and optimism <laughs> and forward thinking for you. Let me put in just a small plug for uh, one of the sessions that's coming up next. It's called Nuke Kids on the Block, which I think is incredibly clever. It is moderated by the NRC's own Miranda Ross, a recent graduate of our uh, Nuclear Regulator Apprenticeship Network, and is also going to be featuring uh, uh, Mira Amiri from uh, Fanner. And uh, I think it'll be a great panel. And it, it, again, if this wasn't a shot in the arm enough, that panel definitely will be. So thank you all very much.